well. It will not do it. It says I'm live, but it won't. But it's not. I'm not. It's not picking up anything. Well, there we go. Maybe now. Let's see. I'm, uh, it says I'm live. Um, it doesn't look that live, <laughs> but uh, it says so. I'm not sure why it's coming through the way it is. I'll need to know from someone if you can hear me. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> well, um, sorry for the delay here. I can't really explain it. Nothing uh, is quite working like it should. I don't know if, uh, if the video is smooth or not, but um, here we are. We'll go ahead and get started, and, and uh, hopefully um, everything's okay and you can hear and, and see me okay. Um, if you've uh, given up, that's okay too. <laughs> I don't blame you. Um, it was a, a difficult fight even to get on. So um, I'll go ahead and start with a word of prayer and uh, then we'll get into things this evening. And again, I apologize for this late start. Um, let's. Uh, our call to worship comes from Psalm 29 verses 1 and 2. It's the Psalm of David. Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let's do that together in prayer. Father, we uh, draw near tonight in the blessed name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we're reminded again of uh, how uh, circumstances sometimes limit us and uh, keep us from doing what we want to do in the way we want to do it. But Lord, we thank you that uh, you have uh, opened the door for us uh, to at least be able to record the message tonight. And we pray that if uh, folks are not able to watch it live, they'll be able to catch it later at another time. Father, um, we ask you to bless us tonight as we spend this time in your word. We thank you for the time we had together this morning uh, around your truth. And we pray now, Father, that uh, tonight um, you'll continue to feed your sheep as only you can. Lord, uh, bless your word to our hearts. Uh, be with those who are able to watch. And uh, Father, um, those who are not able to, uh, we pray, Lord, your hand will be upon them too. And all this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm uh, um, reading tonight from Second Chronicles chapter 32, and uh, beginning with verse 27. Um, so Second Chronicles chapter 32 and verse 27. Hezekiah had very great riches and honor, and he made himself treasuries for silver, for gold for precious stones, for spices, for shields, and for all kinds of desirable items. Storehouses for the harvest of grain, wine, and oil, and stalls for all kinds of livestock, and folds for flocks. We're in Second Chronicles chapter 32, now verse 29. Moreover, he provided cities for himself, and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance. For God had given him very much property. The same Hezekiah also stopped the water outlet of Upper Gion and brought the water by tunnel to the west side of the city of David. Hezekiah prospered in all 
his works. However, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonders that were done in the land, God withdrew from him in order to test him, that he might know all that was in his heart. Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and his goodness, indeed, they are written in the vision of Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, and in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. So Hezekiah rested with his fathers, and they buried him in the upper tombs of the sons of David. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem honored him at his death. Then Manasseh, his son, reigned in his place. And may the Lord bless our reading from his word tonight. In his death, Josephus tells us that the king known as Herod the Great, who ruled the time of Christ's incarnation, suffered a great deal. He had a general collapse of his physical health. He was suffering with a fever, uh, perhaps a form of hives, and a continual pain in his bowels. His feet were seized with tremors, and his abdomen was inflamed. He was struggling with respiratory distress, which uh, kept him upright so that he could breathe. And from time to time, his entire body was racked with convulsions. He took the baths, as the saying goes in England, at uh, Asphaltitis on the far side of the Jordan River uh, for what it was worth, but it really didn't do him much good. Uh, his physicians suggested then that he bathe in a vat of warm oil. And so they prepared this huge vat of warm oil for him. But he nearly died when he was immersed in the oil. Um, Josephus says his, old, his eyes rolled back in his head and he seemed to be losing consciousness. Removed from the vat and revived, he decided to go back across the Jordan to the city of Jericho. And here, uh, seeming to realize that his end was near, he summoned his sister and her husband. Now, it's important to know when you think about this summoning of his sister that, uh, and her husband that Herod had just finished executing his own son a few days earlier. So that surely must have given them pause as they approached the, the suffering king. When they arrived in his presence, they discovered that Herod had ordered the heads of Israel's most notable families out of every town and village to his side and had them assembled in a great arena called the Hippodrome. Josephus then says that Herod addressed his sister, Salome, and her husband, Alexis, in these terms. I know well enough that the Jews will keep a festival upon my death. In other words, they'll celebrate. However, it is in my power to be mourned for on other accounts, and to have a splendid funeral, if you will but be subservient to my commands. Do you but take care to send soldiers to encompass these men that are now in custody, the men in the Hippodrome, and slay them immediately upon my death? And then all Judea and every family of them will weep at it whether they will or no, whether they want to or not. So what Herod was ordering was the slaughter of all these innocent individuals and uh, believing that if they were put to death at the moment that he died, then that would assure mourning throughout Israel. Thankfully, uh, those orders were ignored by Salome and her husband after Herod died. She went into the Hippodrome, and without letting it be known that Herod was dead, she declared that the king had changed his mind, and she said that everyone was free to, to go home to their families and friends. 
certainly it must have been in part to, in some ways, cover his reputation. Now, Herod's funeral was nevertheless a grand affair, but not because he succeeded in executing the innocent men of Israel, the noblemen of Israel, but more probably because he paid all of his soldiers a hefty prize to gain their attention to the matter and because it was in the best interest of his heirs to pretend that they honored rather than dreaded him. You know, beloved, some men and women die nobly and highly regarded by all that know them. Others come to their death, and it's a relief to all who ever had anything to do with them that they are finally gone. There's a tombstone somewhere in New England, if my memory serves me correctly, which is inscribed with th these words, or at least words similar to these. Here lies the body of Elmer's wife. She is at rest at last, and so is he. Uh, the implication there was that uh, his wife's passing finally gave him rest. And I know, before anybody even needs to respond to that, I know that similar epitaphs probably have and could be written about many men as well as about women. So I'm not uh, trying to put women in that place there. I'm just merely saying uh, that that kind of thing happens from time to time. Josephus does mention almost enviously that in regard to his riches and fortune, Herod was quite prosperous. If ever any other man could be so, says Josephus. But he quickly adds, that in his domestic affairs, Herod was the most unfortunate man, which is really a gross understatement. Tonight we want to move backward in time, however, to another king of Judah whose death caused real sorrow and who did not need to bribe men and women to mourn him. Tonight we're going to finish up our look at King Hezekiah, his life and his activities. Our text, as we've read, is from Second Chronicles chapter 32 and verses 27 through 33. And we'll pick up the synopsis of his life in this part of Second Chronicles with verse 27. We read there, Hezekiah had very great riches and honor, and he made himself treasuries for silver, for gold, for precious stones, for spices, for shields, and for all kinds of desirable items storehouses for the harvest of grain, wine, and oil, and stalls for all kinds of livestock and folds for flocks. Moreover, he provided cities for himself and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him very much property. Now that's uh, verses 27 through 29. We note first here that the Lord chose to make Hezekiah very wealthy. We might even say extremely wealthy. You can picture his gold, his silver, and his precious stones uh, as being raked together in piles. Um, he had gold and silver measured by weight in hefty amounts, and the same in clear, bright, costly stones. But notice the way his fortune comes to him according to the word of God. It was God who had given him very much property. I think it's worth noting because it doesn't say, the scripture doesn't say that Hezekiah got this property by and for himself. It doesn't say that Hezekiah accumulated this to himself. It doesn't say that the government distributed it to him that uh, they went through all the governments and all the peoples of the world and taxed them and then gave this portion to Hezekiah. It says, the scripture says, that God gave this to him. That is, God presented it to the king. The one whose property rights are often ignored is the one to whom all things belong, and that is God himself. In Psalm 50, Verses 10, 11, Psalm 50, 10, 11. God says there through his, through his psalmist, Every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. 
I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. Later on in Psalm 104, in verse 24, it says this, O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. That's Psalm 104, verse 24. And then in the prophecy of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 27 and verse 5, we read this. This is Jeremiah, chapter 27 and verse 5. I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are on the ground, by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and have given it to whom it seemed proper to me. God has, by the right of creation, the right to give his possessions to whomever he pleases and to give them in the quantities and the numbers he chooses. The God who blessed Job with great riches permitted their loss in a single day, while the widow who had nothing was put in possession of enough oil to make her rich in relative terms just as quickly. The blessing of riches enjoyed by Hezekiah was a gift from God. God gave it to him, and God gives to us all our possessions and riches and wealth. The blessing of riches enjoyed by Hezekiah actually harks back to the covenant promises made to King David uh, regarding his sons and the fact that those blessings were a heart matter and not a political or a hereditary issue. When you go back to the start of this record regarding the life of Hezekiah, you remember him telling his servants, and you can see it, it's in Second Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 10. That's where we're, we're kind of have this initial uh, introduction to Hezekiah. Hezekiah says, Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. It was the revival and Hezekiah's concern for it that took the preeminence in his thinking. He wasn't thinking of the grandeur of his kingdom or of the wealth and influence of his reign. He was thinking about the glory and the honor of God. And it was this character of heart that uh, God chose to bless. And it is in perfect keeping with uh, the Savior's words in um, Matthew chapter 6. Um, this is verses 31 through 33. They're very familiar, for, familiar to many of you. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And in Hezekiah's case, that's exactly what happened. He put the things of God first. He put the kingdom of God first. And then you see what happens. It, all, all this wealth is added to him and piled up before him. The kingdom of David had split and weakened as a result of their spiritual declension. And it had been that way since the days of the judges. It's a very simple formula. Forsaking God in the days of the judges and in the days of the kings, forsaking God led to confusion, weakness, and subjugation. While fidelity or faithfulness to the Lord, even in the face of looming disaster, brought victory, peace, and prosperity. It's a very simple formula. The psalmist says, and this is Psalm 112, beginning with verse 1. Psalm 112, verse 1, and reading through verse 4. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. 
Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. <coughs> he is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. I would ask you to notice, too, that Hezekiah possessed those things that were most coveted among men. When it says that he made treasuries for all manner of desirable things, you see that phrase there in Second Chronicles? He made treasuries for desirable things. That's the meaning. They were the things that men and women coveted. And he had them, those things, in abundance. Now, I want to be careful to say that this isn't set before us as a means to justify or to some way legitimize some sort of health and wealth gospel. It's not to say if you want to be rich and, and have every worldly thing your heart desires, walk with God, and then you'll become wealthy. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16, John says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of this world. When men take passages like this and, and make that sort of application, it's carnal and it's earthly. The Bible is always lifting our eyes upward, pulling our attention away from the things of this dying world and, and focusing them on spiritual matters and on heavenly thoughts. You see, beloved, the kings of Israel were to be pictures of the greater son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would ascend the throne of David and reign forever and ever. We see this at the very time it was happening to Hezekiah being referred to by his prophet advisor, Isaiah. This is Isaiah chapter 60, and I'm reading verses 1 through 11 there. Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 11. The first part of it will be quite familiar to many of you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. The multitude of camels shall cover your land, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense. They shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. All the flocks of Cater shall be gathered together to you. The rams of Nebaoth shall minister to you. They shall ascend with acceptance on my altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Who are these who fly like a cloud and like doves to their roosts? Surely the coastlands shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish will come first to bring your sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them to the name of the Lord your God, and to the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. The sons of foreigners shall build up your walls, and their king shall minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I have, I have had mercy on you. Therefore your gates shall be open continually, they shall not be shut day or night, that men may bring to you the wealth of the Gentiles, and their kings in procession. These possessions that came to Hezekiah were not meant to appeal to Hezekiah's pride, but they were meant to bear testimony to God's glory and to the greater riches and authority 
that would be exhibited in the kingdom of Christ. As H.A.A. Alexander suggests, these things that we've just read about in Isaiah and were part of the history of Hezekiah's kingdom, these things may be applied, says he, to the growth of the true Israel or chosen people by the calling of the Gentiles, with particular allusion or reference to the wealth of the commercial nations from, among, from among whom the elect of God, the sons of Zion, when they come to the embraces of their unknown mother, shall come bringing their silver and gold with them. And their unknown mother is the church, the church of Jesus Christ. And so all of this is a picture of those things to be fulfilled in Christ Jesus, whether we're talking about the words of Isaiah or whether we're talking about what actually happened to Hezekiah. Now, we know that for Hezekiah, this wealth became a snare to his pride, and it placed him and the people of Judea in serious jeopardy. It happened because he failed to search out the spiritual significance of his prosperity, and he took instead a, a baser view of it. In the end, it would all be carried off to Babylon, only to be one of the sources of their downfall. John Trapp says that these things puffed Hezekiah up. His heart was lifted up with his wealth as a boat rises with the rising of the water that carries it. It becomes us all, beloved, as Christians, to carefully consider the spiritual significance of our property and possessions. Once we lose sight of them as gifts from God and emblems of the still greater blessings to be inherited in Christ, they become a danger to us. When David first heard of the prosperity promised to, his, to him and to his descendants, we read that he went in and sat before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God. And you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. Is this the manner of man, O Lord God? Now what more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, know your servant. For your word's sake and according to your own heart, you have done all these great things. To make your servant know them. When the Lord lays his hands upon you and me, and we prosper, and we gain possessions, great or small, that's a part of the indication to us of God's blessing on us for Christ's sake. It is God taking all that he possesses and giving us a part of it because we're his in Christ Jesus. Later, for David, when the collections for the building of the temple under Solomon surpassed David's wildest expectations, he cried out, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people? that we should be able to offer so willingly as this. For all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. David was overwhelmed with the goodness of God to him, and he said, We thank and we praise your glorious name. And it appears that Hezekiah drifted away from that concept or that understanding of his possession of his possessions, and that's why pride got a hold of him. 
these things, these earthly possessions that we have, our property and our, our wealth, whatever it is, great or small, they're only a blessing to us so far as God makes them so. And he does that by keeping our hearts fixed on him and not on those things. Jesus put this matter in perspective for us uh, when he said this, and this is in Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 10, the gospel of Luke chapter 16 and verse 10. Jesus says there, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, that is, the, the possessions and property that you accumulate in this world, if you have not been faithful in regard to that, remembering that it's a gift from God, and that it is a blessing from God. Who will commit to your trust the true riches? You see what Jesus is saying there? The implication of that final phrase is that the true riches are the things of the Spirit and have to do with our love for God and not the mammon of this world. Well, next we see, and I've got to hurry along here because we are already have started so late. But next we see that the Lord blessed Hezekiah with a clever mind, and he employed it prudently. You see that there in verse 30, back now in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, in verse 30. The same Hezekiah also stopped the water outlet of Upper Gion and brought the water by tunnel to the west side of the city of David. And then it says this, Hezekiah prospered in all his works. And the key phrase here is that last one, of course, Hezekiah prospered in all his works or ways. His efforts were blessed and they were moved forward and they were good and they proved profitable. And all of that was the evidence of God's hand being on Hezekiah. Without the blessing of God, even the most promising prospects can create reverses rather than progress, can prove disastrous rather than useful, and rather than being profitable, can be most costly. You know, while the nations of men and women are trying to make themselves out to be gods, the one true and living God humbles them that they may know themselves to be just that only men and women of dust or clay. David prayed this in Psalm 9. This is Psalm 9, verse 19 and, verses 19 and 20. Arise, O Lord, do not let man, man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. We see here that David was concerned that the nations not be allowed, even for a moment, to appear to be stronger or greater than God himself. And he did that because he was so jealous of the honor of God. And it's vital, beloved, that we consider in all our national concerns that it's not our comfort or our privileges that we're most concerned with, but the honor of our God. That such issues were a part of the heart and thinking of our founding fathers is undeniable. Elbridge Jerry is probably not a name that just springs to mind. <laughs> um, Elbridge Jerry, uh, G-E-R-R-Y, um, is probably somewhat a foreign name unless you happen to be uh, aware of the names of all the signers of the Declaration of Independence. He was one of those. He was a member of the Constitutional Convention. He helped to frame our original Bill of Rights. And he was the governor of Massachusetts. And most importantly, he was vice president of the United States of America. While he was governor of Massachusetts, 
in a series of proclamations from 1811 to 1813, he urged the people of Massachusetts to pray first that with one heart and voice we may prostrate ourselves at the throne of heavenly grace and present to our great benefactor sincere and unfeigned thanks for his infinite goodness and mercy towards us from our birth as a nation to the present moment for having above all things illuminated us by the gospel of Jesus Christ, presenting to our view the happy prospect of a blessed immortality. He challenged the citizens of this infant nation to pray for forgiveness for what he described as our unparalleled ingratitude to that adorable being who has seated us in a land irradiated by the cheering beams of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us fall prostrate before offended deity, confess sincerely and penitently our manifold sins and our unworthiness of the least of his divine favors, fervently imploring his pardon through the merits of our mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. Later he added this, let us contemplate the blessings which have flowed from the unlimited grace and favor of offended deity of our God. That we are still permitted to enjoy the first of heaven's blessings, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see there the burden for the glory of God, um, the, the burden of this vice president, that we be that we we as a nation have a sense of gratitude for the fact that we live in a land where where the gospel of Jesus Christ is, has radiated out in the the preaching of the truth this is the posture that puts political leaders like these men and like king hezekiah in a position where god may freely bless their efforts so that they prosper in all their works because in their hearts their prosperity is not a, a, something that they have accumulated or something that they have achieved but it's a gift from God and it will be Jehovah who receives the honor and the glory in their minds and their hearts and, and when minds and hearts are set that way then God can prosper people because ultimately he will be the one who receives the glory and the honor and the praise and the thanksgiving from the people who have been prospered. You think about how our own hearts have been blessed by Hezekiah's story. And just to ask yourself, is it because Hezekiah comes across to us in the Bible as so wise? Is that why we've been blessed by it? Have we been blessed in this study because Hezekiah comes across as so powerful? It Does it come to us because Hezekiah was so successful? Or is it because we have seen how good and how merciful God is to his people by grace? We all know the answer to that question. Not because of how great Hezekiah was. It's because of how great and good God was. In Psalm 145, verses 8 through 9, we read, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Now, we also know that Hezekiah was tested, and I'm only going to touch on this briefly. That's verse 31. However, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, um, the Lord did that to test his heart. We don't need to linger here because we've dealt with that in the context of Hezekiah's life earlier. But it's perhaps wise and useful to point out that such tests in the hands of God are very revealing. He quickly discovers what's in the hearts of men and women or in the heart of a nation by a little testing. Uh, as we drove home along the Columbia River last week, uh, it was extremely windy. 
the wind was driving the great waters of that river into frothing whitecaps, agitating the surface and making it look uh, all worked up, so to speak. And uh, my dear friend, who I don't know, but who enjoy reading all the time, John Trapp, the Puritan commentator, says that this is the way of temptation on the hearts and minds of men. The wind was adding nothing to the river. It wasn't adding any water. It wasn't adding any rocks. There, there was nothing in the water. It was adding nothing to the water itself to, to make it effervescent. Neither was it taking anything out of the water. It was merely blowing across the surface. But what a stir it was making. And Trapp says it's that way with temptation. It doesn't add anything. It doesn't remove anything. It just agitates. And then the heart, like the river, responds in one way or another. Trapp adds, the humility that Hezekiah showed when the prophet admonished him and his perseverance in piety show that God never quite deprived him of his grace. And that's what we rejoice in here. Now, finally, we read this, and this is verse 33. So Hezekiah rested with his fathers, and they buried him in the upper tombs of the sons of David. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem honored him at his death. Then Manasseh, his son, reigned in his place. Now, the Hebrew language is a, is a wonderful language in many ways. And essentially, what we're told here is that Judah and all the people of Jerusalem highly valued Hezekiah. It's the same word used earlier when it talks about Hezekiah's own riches. When he died, they considered it a treasure lost. Matthew Henry says this, See how the honor of serious godliness is manifested in the consciences of men. Though it is to be feared that the generality of the people did not heartily comply with the reforming kings, yet they could not but praise their endeavors for reformation, and the memory of those kings was blessed among them. It is a debt we owe to those who have been eminently useful in their days to do them honor at their death. When they are out of the reach of flattery, and we have seen the end of their conversation, the due payment of this debt will be an encouragement to others to do likewise. And so it was, and so it was. never again would, would Jerusalem see a king like this until Jesus Christ himself entered the city. And you know what happened then. But as you look at, those, look at that last verse, there is a sad and frightening formality implied here. It's suggested that Hezekiah was more valued in his death than in his life. We've all seen it. Men and women venerated in their death who were not properly respected in their life. The overall picture here, when you pull back and look at it, suggests that this treasuring of Hezekiah was limited. They hated to lose a rich and powerful ruler, I think, more than to lose a good and godly one. And the reason we say that in part is because of what Isaiah writes at the time of Hezekiah's death. In Isaiah chapter 57, verse 1, and these verses are by commentators associated with Hezekiah. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 1. Isaiah writes, and of course not just Hezekiah, but others like him. The righteous perishes and no man takes it to heart. Merciful men are taken away, while no one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil. Hezekiah is plucked out of the scene. 
because of the judgment that's about to come because of the wickedness of the people. And that brings us to this ominous announcement. Then Manasseh, his son, reigned in his place. We'll begin next week, Lord willing, a look into that reign and to see what lessons we might learn for our own time uh, from it. But for now, may it just be said that the revival under Hezekiah is a short-lived one. Hezekiah doesn't live as long as Manasseh does. He doesn't reign nearly as long as Manasseh. The time of spiritual renewal is replaced with a time of trial. And once again, we find the sheep being separated from the goats. It's a reminder, beloved, of how quickly things can change and why Paul urges you and me in Romans chapter 13 with these words. He says there, and, and this sort of ties in with what we were saying this morning. He says there in Romans chapter 13, verse 8, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, says Paul, knowing that the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Time changes very quickly. Circumstances change very quickly. There's this great day of revival during the lifetime of Hezekiah. But when he's gone, there's a sad and serious regression that leads to judgment for all those who knew those days. We want to be about our Father's business in our Father's time. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this great story of Hezekiah. It's been such a blessing to go through it. It has encouraged us. It has instructed us. And Lord, we thank you for the wisdom uh, that comes from it. Lord, we thank you for the work you did in this time and for the, the blessing that you brought through this man and the blessing you brought to him. We pray, Father, that we will carefully consider our own times and, Lord, that we'll be faithful to make the best use of the freedom and the liberty and the privileges that we have right now. We pray, Lord, that we'll reflect carefully on our own prosperity and blessing. And see it for what it is, Lord. These things that we have, they're just uh, indications of the greater things that are ours because of Christ, because of the inheritance we have in him. Spiritual riches that are beyond compare. Lord, we thank you that those things are, are, are ours. And we pray that as we look on the things that we have, we'll remember that they are yours. And, Father, that we'll use them for your glory. Not be tempted to pride. Not use them for ourselves, but for you and your kingdom's sake. And, Lord, we, we pray that you will help us to keep our eyes on you. That, uh, Lord, we might not lose sight of who we are and what we are as the children of the King. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you for sending our King to redeem us. And Lord, we look forward to that day when we will rejoice before him 
we believe, with King Hezekiah, standing before your throne and uh, giving you all the praise and the honor and the glory for your grace and mercy to us through Jesus Christ. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all tonight. Amen. Good night, and thanks for being patient and bearing with us.